Very good morning. It's great to be back in Leiden on this spot, but now in the capacity of the project leader of the Switch project from Vienna. So that was quite a change, I must say, from the past. Um, and I've been commissioned to explain why you are here. Now, you are here because the European Union is very much interested in issues like switch, sharing a world of inclusion, creativity, and heritage. We forgot to suggest technology, otherwise it would have been a switch like a real switch where you can make a difference. So it's a switch without a T. But that is what the European Union is interested in, and that is why, we finance, why they finance a group of 10 museums in Europe to meet over a period of four years and discuss issues of these issues and their importance for the museum world. I think it's fantastic that they do so. Of course, there is a changing Europe. There's a changing world at large. But the changes in Europe, they are financeable. They can get money and the changes in the world at large. We don't know where the funding comes from. So that is why we focus on that. But changes are everywhere. And I think we are all very happy that the world changes. Because just imagine that there would be no change at all. That would be very, very boring. If there would have been no change at all, Barbara Plankensteiner, who is one of the um, intellectual authors of the Switch program, together with Wayne Modest and Laura van Brookhofen, she would still be in Vienna and Laura would still be in Leiden. And there would have been no change at all. Well, they have started moving. Barbara went to Yale and is soon going to come back to Europe again, to Hamburg. It's been announced this week and we're all very happy that we have her back in Europe to assist in what we're doing here. And I want you to join me in an applause for her fantastic appointment in the Hamburg Museum. In Vienna, we are very, very proud that she has come, comes back to Europe and is going to do this big job. Laura is out of the Switch project now, so the applause for her, she won't hear it. Um, change. To me, this is a very different spot now from the one that I left four and a half years ago. This museum is all about people. This museum is no longer one museum. It's one, one museum with three venues. It's completely different from the museum that I left. It's become much more important, much bigger, and doing fantastically. When I came to this building for the first time, as director of the Leiden Museum in 1992. This actually was our office wing. And there was a little exhibition on the right hand side and a little bit to the left, but the University of Leiden was also housed here. And the Museum of the History of Science was occupying the building that now houses the research center itself. And actually, this museum had been here only from 1937, when it took over this building from the academic hospital, which had started on this very spot only in 1860, to have grown out of this building, having become too big, so it had to move to the other side of the railway station. And all these big buildings that you see the other side of the railway line are second generation academic hospital. It's about 100 times as big as it was originally when it was here. So if we think that museums are lagging behind 100 years after the academic hospitals, imagine where this museum is going to be in 100 years from now. It will occupy all those premises over there and will be much, more, much bigger and much more important. When the academic hospital was built on this spot in the city of Leiden, the National Museum, the, the um, Ethnological Museum was already there. It was founded officially in 1863, but it went back to 1837 when the Siebold collection was opened at the, um, at the Rappenburg, at what is now the Siebold House. And it, had, it, charged, it started changing and growing. And the Dutch became very much interested in urgent anthropology and urgent collecting. 
And a lot of collections were brought into the Netherlands, especially from Indonesia. So that 100 years after the, its original um, foundation in 1837, in 1937, when this museum opened on this spot, it already had collected 100,000 objects, which they then could put on display. They had never been able to put it on display. It was scattered all around the city in all sorts of different buildings where no one could find his way and where they took the queen to get lost. So that, that was an urgent argument to have more buildings for this museum. But it was only 18, 1937, this, this museum opened for the public at large. And then it explained the exotic world far away. And then Europe started changing. There was a war. And there was a period of decolonization after the war. And this museum lost its relevance, though it didn't, didn't, didn't recognize that. that. It was no longer about, it was still about exotic peoples far away, but the people from far away had started moving to the Netherlands. And they became our neighbors. And it took this museum, like many other museums in this, similar, similar museums, quite a long time to find out that the changing demographics of the world around them had very, very important implications for the mission and um, the statements that the museum was going to make. That was the changes. And those changes have a lot of influence on the thinking of museums. And this thinking about what is the real mission of the museum, it continues and continues and continues. And that is why we have switched to bring you all together to discuss these issues, to have the conversations, and to find out what the real issues right, are right now and how we should address them. I am looking forward very much to a fantastic program designed here at the Research Center of Material Culture with a lot of interesting speakers and a lot of interesting conversations. And I'm happy that my staff from the Vienna Museum can be involved in those conversations, talking about the new gallery on Col colonialism that we're going to open next year in October, the new gallery on migration that will be in our Vienna World Museum, and compare notes with colleagues from the SWITCH project. So thank you very much, Wayne and your staff, for um, creating this fantastic program with the fantastic speakers. I wish all of you two very fruitful days and a lot of discussions, and that was what I wanted to say. Thank you. When we started to do this conference, I must admit to you, um, it felt already urgent. It felt urgent at the moment that we started to come up with the idea because I, it was at the moment when we, some of us talk about the, 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 the fluctuating, the refugee crisis, a word that I, crisis I'm not often excited about using. So it started me to think about the anxious politics, what a colleague of mine and I have, have coined the anxious politics of the present, where anxiety seemed to be a part of our political moment to understand what Europe is, who constitutes the European, and who belongs here. But that coincided with a moment when a lot of other things was, were changing. Globally, we see what was happening with Black Lives Matter, roads must fall, and there was an urgency internationally that was going through the mediascape, through the webscape, where there was a lot of discussion about how to deal with the afterlife of colonial projects in the present, and what does it mean for questions of equality and distribution. And then the project itself seemed urgent. But then, and I'm not going to, it is not my intention to cast stones. Then there was Brexit. I'm not casting stones as the British people here. <laughs> and Brexit caused me to again wonder with the kind of questions, the, what I would call the vitriol, about and, and the, 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 the rising importance of visible difference and how people saw visible difference and, and questions of exclusion. Because Brexit was an indictment on who can be a citizen. And what does that mean when your citizenship is questioned, primarily because of you, the historical trajectory to which you, which you um, are, are a part of, the racial formation which you've been placed in, or the religious ideology which you choose or not choose? Because many of these were not choices. Many of these are 
some of how we live in the world is not about choice. It is actually how we live in the world and we ascribe certain things to people. And then nobody could open a conference like this would, without talking that we are still in the Trump moment. I won't say we are post-Trumpian, there's no such a thing. We are actually pre-Trump because we don't know what he's going to do. And the same kind of conversations emerging, emerging about who can belong. So it is important for us as museum, museums like ours, marked with the collections that we have, marked with the histories that we've been a part of, marked with the positions that we maintain within our societies to think through what is our role in these discussions. And it is that that we invite scholars together to think with us over the next two days. And what is, as I said before, fascinating and important for us, because one of the things that SWITCH does, what every trans-European project does, is that it allows us to think comparatively about what citizenship might mean as we move from Belgium to France, from France to the Netherlands, from the Netherlands to England, with our different histories, different colonial projects, but also different ways in which we constitute the notion of who belongs or not belong. We at this museum think that it is urgent, as Stein said, to be a part of those discussions. I invite you to the first session, which is Museums, Colonialism, and its Afterlife, and for the first speaker, Peter Schier, who, um, who will speak to you about the nation state autochthony and the struggle over differences, challenges for the ethnographic museum.